Nuclear weapons are the most destructive devices ever composed by mankind. Able to wipe cities off the map with the push of a button, ballistic missiles carrying nuclear warheads have maintained the dual role of deterrence ever since their debut in the 1950s. The means of delivering nuclear missiles has varied through the years, be they from fixed launchers, silos, or even submarines. What few know of, however, is the airborne application of the Minuteman missile. In 1974, an experiment was conducted with the largest airlift platform in the American inventory. Its goal was to evaluate the feasibility of launching a Minuteman missile from a C-5 galaxy. Was the test successful? Are we packing ballistic missiles in cargo planes today? All this and more coming right up. The LGM-30 Minuteman series of missiles has its roots in the Second World War. The first true ballistic missile was developed by the Third Reich. Designed as the A-4, the missile was better known as the V-2, and was launched into suborbital arcs to strike allied cities like London and Antwerp. Germany wasn't the only nation working on ballistic missiles. By the latter days of World War II, Belgian-born scientist Carol Bossart was actively developing his own missile design inspired by the V-2, which was projected to have enough smash to get it across the Atlantic Ocean. Remember Boss Art, he'll be important later. Anyway, 1945 rolled around and the first use of atomic bombs against the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki ended the war and brought about the nuclear age. With the defeat of the Axis, the two superpowers of the United States and the Soviet Union found themselves as the two big kids on the block, and both wanted a nuclear arsenal. As the 1940s gave way to the 1950s, delivery of nuclear weapons was relegated to intercontinental bombers like the B-29 Superfortress, TU-4 Bull, and of course, the right hand of the U.S. Air Force's Strategic Air Command, the Convair B-36 Peacemaker. Sorry, I just uh, really like that airplane. Now, bombers are really cool, and a vital asset for any superpower, but the ability for a large aircraft to get through enemy air defenses was coming into question as improved anti-aircraft technology sprouted up. Radar-guided AAA and brand new surface-to-air missiles such as the American Nike and the Soviet S-25 Berkut could, in theory, knock down the high-flying but slow propeller-driven bombers. Not to mention, as jet technology improved, the threat of interceptors also had to be overcome. In the Korean War, B-29 bombers fell victim to MiG-15 attacks. The once untouchable super fortresses of World War II vintage were easily slaughtered by the communist fighters, and by war's end, 16 forts were downed by MiG cannon fire and at least four to AAA. So there was doubt that bombers could fulfill the nuclear mission alone. The US Army at this time saw land-based missiles in a similar role to their World War II counterparts, to be used as long-range artillery. The problem with missiles at this time was that the majority of them were launched from fixed launchers and were thus exposed to enemy attacks. Not to mention, liquid fuel was the primary source of powering early ballistic missiles, which were still too small to carry a nuclear warhead anyway. Early missiles like the Redstone, which was a direct development of the V-2, were also relatively short-ranged. Unlike bombers that had an intercontinental reach, land-based missiles couldn't achieve orbit and were thus relegated intermediate-ranged rules. At the time, you were looking at about 250 miles of smash if you were lucky. So ballistic missiles were a dead end, right? Our boy Carol Bossart, who I mentioned before, had been developing improvements to missile technology all the way through the 1940s and 50s. Now affiliated with the Convair Aircraft Company, Bossart was promoted to Chief Designer of Project Atlas, the first real attempt to construct an intercontinental ballistic missile which was powerful enough to lob a nuclear warhead into space. As opposed to the Redstone family, which was composed of multiple fuel tanks within an outer casing, Bossart proposed that the outer casing of the missile itself could be the nitrogen and kerosene propellant tank. As long as the propellant stage of the missile was kept pressurized, it would keep enough structural rigidity to stay together until the warhead could separate in space. This saved on weight, allowing the upper stage to actually achieve orbit, and thus, a true intercontinental ballistic missile was born. Known as the SM-65, the Atlas fell not into the Army's inventory, but the US Air Force's SAC as another tool to deliver a nuclear weapon into the Kremlin's mailbox. 
Of course, the Atlas wasn't perfect. It still had the issue of being launched from a static tower and took time for fueling. The nitrogen pressurization was also a point of contention, for if the rocket depressurized, it wouldn't have enough integrity to hold together on the pad, which, for example, resulted in the loss of an Agena launch vehicle in 1963. Its implementation was not to be a first strike weapon, but for secondary strikes after the initial bomber attacks. The Air Force still sought a more expedient and survivable solution. The Atlas missile gave way to the more powerful Titan series in the mid-1960s. With Titan came the ability to store the missile in an underground silo. The Titan still had the drawback of using liquid fuel, however, which needed to be pumped into the missile before firing. While the Titan II series allowed this process to take place within minutes, an alternative to the highly toxic chemicals was found in solid fuel. Now, your boy Falcon here is no chemist and I can hardly pronounce half of the shit that goes into rocket fuel, but I do know that solid rocket propellant is much safer to handle and can be stored for extended periods. Solid propellant had already been used for years on smaller rockets. Its real drawback is that it can't really be throttled. Once it's lit, it's going to keep burning until it runs out. For things like aircraft, artillery, and anti-tank rockets, this really isn't that much of a problem whatsoever. Initially, the Air Force conceptualized solid fuel rockets to take on the medium-range role of the Redstone, but Colonel Edward Hall felt that an intercontinental missile could be propelled by such a fuel. Hall, a World War II veteran who was responsible for capturing V-2 rocket intelligence after the conflict, felt that solid propellants could offer a quick reaction time in the event of a nuclear exchange, one even faster than the Titan missile offered. And so, Colonel Hall went to work, formulating a concept of missile farms, a self-sustaining environment where missiles could be assembled from factory shipments, maintained, stored in silos, and even recycled at the end of their lifespan. If a missile were to reach the end of its storage life, it could easily be swapped out with a replacement. All this, and the missiles could be fired within seconds should the balloon go up. Reduction of weight, cost, and form factor were the priorities when designing the new missile. Tipped with a W-56 or 59 warhead, Minuteman 1 could reliably land within two clicks of any designated target in the Soviet Union thanks to an aeronautics D-17 computer guidance system. Unlike liquid-fueled rockets that could adjust in flight to make corrections, the Minuteman could open vents to decrease thrust as needed at its apogee to reliably hit its mark. At the missile's peak of deployment, over 1,000 Minutemen dotted the American countryside. Ellsworth, South Dakota, Minot, North Dakota, F.E. Warren in Wyoming, and Whiteman in Missouri all played home to the new missiles, which were guarded round the clock by security police forces. In addition to land-based Minutemen, the U.S. Navy around this time developed the Polaris series of missiles for their submarine forces. For the first time, America had a true nuclear triad in the form of bombers, land-based, and submarine-based weapons. Of course, an air-launched ballistic missile was still a pipe dream, as the AGM-48 Skybolt program had been cancelled in 1962. The program would have seen suborbital ballistic missiles fired from B-52s and Avro Vulcans. Interestingly, the Skybolt shared the same warhead with the Miniman. In the early 1970s, the idea of an air-launched ballistic missile was still floating in the Air Force's head, but what aircraft could even carry, let alone launch something like a Minuteman in flight? Alright, so we're switching gears for a bit. In the world of military cargo aircraft, you have two philosophies. Tactical and strategic airlifting. Tactical airlift encompasses smaller cargo planes like the C-130 Hercules or A-400 Atlas, which can carry a platoon of troops and maybe a couple light vehicles. Tactical airlifters can typically operate from unprepared airfields to deliver assets to the front. Now, the C-130 is a pretty big plane, but I say smaller because, uh, well, <laughs> here's what a strategic airlifter looks like next to one. This big f***ing thing is the C-5 Galaxy the largest aircraft in the U.S. Air Force's inventory. This is a strategic airlifter, meant to ship in vital and heavy assets to a theater. The C-5 can haul up to 81 passengers and two UH-1 Hueys or M1A-1 main battle tanks. To give you an idea of the scale of this beast, the wingspan of the Galaxy is 223 feet, which is almost double that of the Wright brothers' first flight. Only the Ukrainian Antonov-225 surpassed the Galaxy in size, but keep in mind, there was only one while well, the U.S. Air Force maintains at least 50 C-5s. While we're here, let's pour one out for the dream, though. The Russians destroying her cut down an important piece of aviation history. But hey, if all goes well, the Ukrainian government wants to rebuild her. Cheers to that. Anyway, back to the galaxy. 
The C5 was envisioned as a replacement for the Douglas C-131 Cargo Master in the early 1960s. Several companies came forth with proposals, but the Lockheed Aircraft Company's design was selected in 1964. Lockheed already had extensive experience with heavy lift aircraft, notably their legendary C-130 and C-141. In fact, the C-141's overall configuration was a good starting point for the much larger C-5, featuring an opening nose and T-tail design. Despite some early teething and development issues, the C-5 entered service in 1970. Until the C-5 entered service, the only aircraft able to haul the Minuteman missile was the C-141, which was actually designed to allow a single missile container to slide into its cargo bay. While I couldn't find any information on how many missiles the C-5 can carry at once, the Air Force did do something funny with the gigantic plane. October 24th, 1974. A lone C-5 of the 65 12th Test Squadron took off, bound for the Pacific Test Range. Within its hold was a modified Minuteman 1 strapped to a series of pallets. The goal of the test was to evaluate the feasibility of dropping missiles from C-5s in anticipation of the Minuteman's replacement, the Peacekeeper, then known as the MX program. Note, this test was not to just drop a missile under parachute for delivery, no no no. After the C-5 was clear of the parachutes, the pallets would slip away and the missile's booster would ignite. And that's exactly what happened. A ballistic missile successfully dropped from a cargo plane, powered up in flight, and had an engine burn of 10 seconds before falling into the sea. The C-5 was capable of launching nuclear missiles. And they never did it again! I mean, let's think about it. As awesome as it is, an Air Mobile Minuteman isn't the most practical mode of delivering a warhead. The Air Force decided that bombers packing low-altitude cruise missiles and land-based arrows were more efficient than having vital airlift assets on constant readiness for a nuclear launch. That being said, there's nothing really keeping the stunt from being repeated. And in my book, that makes the C-5 Galaxy the deadliest aircraft in our inventory in a weird roundabout way, and that's pretty cool. As we close out my second year of doing aviation history videos, I want to thank my partner in crime, Hellion, once more for helping me get this channel rolling with their amazing art. In addition, my lovely patrons have lined my wallet enough to keep a roof over my head. A special thanks goes out to my Ace of Aces tier. You guys really are the real G's. Special thanks to Captain Fantastic, Chuck45, Deuce, Ghoul, Iron, Jake Fuentes, Kodai, <gasps> Chris Quinn, Peck Ops, Private Petey, Shockwave, Tico, and last but never least, Weefy. You guys have a good one, and keep that sun in your back.